This is the anatomy of the trials and tribulations of a cold virus trying to survive. This story has many twists and turns, so you may want to watch it several times. But first, a little background. Up through the 19th century, we were busy exploring all the nooks and crannies here on Earth. In the 20th century, we focused on outer space. But with the new technologies available, we have turned to an even more exciting and little-known universe, the human cell. To get an idea of the size of the world we are about to explore, some 250 typical cells fit on the period at the end of a sentence. With this new technology, we now have working 3D models of the molecules and proteins in the cell. For the first time, we can visit this complex universe that we know so little about and see it in action. So much for the background. This story is about one of the hundreds of types of cold viruses. Viruses are not capable of making copies of themselves. This cold virus is the main character in the presentation. We will follow its desperate effort to take over a cell. With a limited life of from a few hours to days, their primary goal in life is to find a cell that they can invade and take over its factories to make copies of itself, so it can survive. As you will see, it is up against our fantastic defense system. Our immune system has a variety of weapons it will use. But back to our virus. On the surface of each of our cells are markers called antibodies that identify us. We each have a distinctive marker. This is our cold virus's marker. He cannot hide it. Now an example of a 3D protein that exists in a cell. This insert shows the best view we had of a cell's kinesin transporter up to until a few years ago. Compare that to this new technology model. There is no light in the cell and all the molecules are colorless, so some liberties have been taken in this presentation to clarify the activity. With our limited knowledge of this new world, some assumptions have been made. With this new technology, in our presentations, we can use some of the cell's 100,000 battery-operated transporters as our tour buses. To keep these scenes in perspective, remember that some 250 cells fit on the period at the end of a sentence. In this presentation, you'll see the virus sneak rides hidden in the cargo. Our virus has to first enter the body. 90% of the germs enter through the nose and nasal passages. We generate from 2 to 3 quarts of mucus a day that wash the germs and dust down into our gut. If our virus survives this far, it enters a nasal passage blood vessel to find a suitable cell to invade. It must get to a factory to make copies of itself. It must first enter the cell. Our body cell's membrane have a variety of gatekeepers, each of which let in only one specific type of molecule. Our virus, with its foreign marker plainly visible, must somehow sweet-talk its way past the gatekeeper. We are now inside the cell, and the virus hitches a ride with other cargo to the cell's nucleus, the home of the cell's family jewels, the DNA. The DNA contains the instructions for making the cell, for making replacement parts, and the operating instructions for all the proteins. The DNA in a typical cell is six feet long. 
Our language has 26 letters, while the DNA language has only four. The words are only three letters long. This is the name of one of the cell's building blocks. The virus somehow splices in the instructions for making copies of itself into the DNA. That is the goal of the virus. It is not capable of making copies of itself, so it must invade a cell to pass on its heritage. The messenger RNA delivers the modified RNA with the virus instructions to the factories. You will recall that the virus is not capable of making copies of itself. It will use this cell's factories to make the copies. This is how it is done. The ribosome factory reads the first three letters of the instructions for making the virus and finds a building block with the complementary three letters floating by and attaches it to the instructions. It then moves on to the next three letters. The first building block is detached. The process continues to complete the virus subassembly. A single factory can make 2,000 parts a second. Now let's watch it in action. The virus subassemblies are trucked to the Golgi apparatus. Here the viruses are assembled, inspected, and stored. The modified RNA instructions told the factories to continue making viruses until the cell actually explodes. The newly constructed viruses flood the blood vessels. The newly constructed viruses flood the blood vessels. Enter the macrophage. The name translated means the big eater. The job of these garbage collectors is to patrol the blood vessels and lymph nodes and digest all the dead cells, which are broken down into building blocks to be used by the factories. Sooner or later, a macrophage comes upon a virus with a foreign marker or antibody. It immediately absorbs it and places a piece of the virus with its marker on its outer surface. It then releases a chemical alarm. There are thousands of different types of helper cells floating around but the one whose antibody matches the piece of the virus is attracted and turned on. It rushes off to the bone marrow to make billions of copies of various immune cells that will hunt down this specific virus. The helper T cells divide to make millions of copies of B cells, M cells, and killer T cells. You will now see the role each of these play in combating the virus.
The killer T cell punches a hole in the affected cell and releases all the juices. The activated plasma cells can produce tens of thousands of its Y-shaped antibodies a second that flood the blood vessels. The antibodies attach to the viruses, disarming them, and call out the macrophage to finish the job. After the battle, the macrophage clear out all the debris. The M cells, with its copy of the matching antibody, move to the bone marrow library. It will be used if this specific cold virus invades again, dramatically reducing the combat time. And that is the story of our cold virus's valiant effort to survive.